friend, uh, Ryan Logan, who left Megan and left me behind um, and took a big fancy job with FEMA. And he's a program specialist up in Atlanta. And he manages um, Georgia, Alabama, South Carolina, North Carolina, everywhere that has a lot of disasters in the last six months has been where he has. So he's been up in Raleigh and now he'll be going to Alabama. So he's had a busy couple months. Year. Six months, mm -hmm. yeah. So, um, you know, we've heard a lot about disasters, of course, in the news just this past week, even, you know, locally down in Macon County, the tornado touched down. So uh, sometimes when we think about New Year's resolutions, we kind of forget about like the big things. And so while of course we can't prevent against natural disasters, we can prepare ourselves. And I think his information is really valuable for all of us as we think ahead to the upcoming year. And as we see kind of these natural disasters impact our area, we definitely want to be prepared. So if you'll join me in welcoming Ryan. Thank you. All right. Can everybody hear me okay without having to stand by a microphone? Because I tend to pace when I talk. Um, well, like Rachel said, um, I'm Ryan Logan. I'm an emergency management program specialist for FEMA Region 4, uh, which covers the, state, the eight southeastern states. So we've got Mississippi, Alabama, Florida, Georgia, South Carolina, North Carolina, Tennessee, and Kentucky. Um, of which, in the past year, has probably been one of the most disaster uh, prone areas um, as well as you know we pretty much have all the hurricane states um, as well so we're the largest region in the country and we're also uh, the busiest region in the country uh, like Rachel said I actually when I left Macon um, I was with the Red Cross and was took a position at our national headquarters um, and have field office in Atlanta and then I was recruited by FEMA to come to work for them um, and so it'll be a year at the end of February and of the past 11 months, I have spent a total of three months in my home. Um, eight months of which I've been on the road uh, working in the disaster areas from Alabama uh, for three months and then five months. Current, uh, I just got back last week from North Carolina and spent five months up there. Um, like Rachel said, you know, preparedness is, is a key um, to anything um, that we can actually advocate for you guys to be a part of. Um, you know, when people think about disasters and disaster response, immediately people think about the government coming in, emergency responders coming in and saving the day. And that's partly true. Um, you know, at FEMA we like to say we're not the team, we're part of the team, which includes local, state, um, and uh, county governments, as well as the nonprofit sector, voluntary agencies, the Salvation Armies, the Baptist Men, the Red Crosses of the world. Um, but more importantly, the public, um, because I don't think we do a good enough job of really educating the public on what their responsibility is um, for themselves, not just when a disaster happens, but, but all the time. Because a lot of the things that we're going to talk about today are not just for the major disasters. They're things that you can actually apply to your everyday life for when those small emergencies do happen. Uh, when I was here in Macon, I was emergency services director for the Red Cross, and you know, you all live in a community that Fires happen here, single family fires here happen every 24 hours, at least somebody's getting burned out of their home. Um, and as unfortunate that is, you know, some of that can be minimized, um, the impact on the individuals if they had taken some precautionary uh, measures or making some preparedness plans. So that's really what we're going to talk about today and I think it's a good time to do it. Um, considering that you know I know Rachel and, and the great job she does with the wellness program and how everybody's New Year's resolutions is typically to lose weight for the coming year and burn off what they gained over the holidays but we're really trying to p encourage people to also make the resolution to be prepared this year um, you know you guys do live in a very disaster prone location I mean how many of y'all lived here in 94 during the floods how many people were living here in 2008 during the Mother's Day tornadoes um, you know, it happens. How many people live in Monroe County where it happened just a few months ago up the road? So it happens and it's going to happen again. So it's not a matter of, you know, if it happens, it's just when it's going to happen. Um, 2011 saw one of the largest, if not the largest, um, years for economic injury for disasters. As you can see, according to the National Climatic Data Center during 2011, more than b more billion dollar disasters occurred than ever. Um, that picture right there is the, this is uh, I-20 and this is the exit to Tuscaloosa and that's the tornado um, in April of, of last year. Um, you know, disasters do a great deal of damage, not only just financially, 
but emotionally as well. Um, you know, during Alabama, 243 people lost their lives. Um, that's 243 too many. Um, just as recently, as of you know, yesterday, there were only two deaths in Alabama, but again, that's two lives too many. So anything that we can do now to prepare and to make you guys a little bit safer so that you're not as impacted when something like this does happen is really kind of our goal. Um, also, that last sentence, during 2011, there were over 100 major disasters declared. That is a, a huge number. When you think about it as a taxpayer, that's a hundred, over a hundred disasters that your tax money is having to foot the bill on to go in and provide financial assistance or some sort of assistance to survivors. It's an expensive, expensive ordeal. Um, and so, you know, again, anything we can do to mi minimize the impact, not only to just you, but also to your community is what we're striving for. All right, so now's the time to really think about what it is that you guys need to be thinking about um, in order to prepare yourself. Um, you know, what, what is unique about your family that you need to prepare for? And when I say family, I'm also going to throw pets in there because some people love their pets more than they love their children. So we can't leave them out as well. Um, and a lot of people won't leave their homes or won't do anything without their pet. And so we want to make sure that they're taken care of as well in your planning. So some of the stuff we'll think through today. Um, how do you communicate? How many of us now can't live without our iPhones, Blackberries, Facebook, Twitter, cell phones, whatever? You know, like how many of y'all will be on it throughout the course of my presentation doing what you do? <laughs> You know, I'm guilty of it as well. I mean, it's, it's, it's my crackberry. It's called a crackberry for a reason. You know, I'm addicted to it. Um, but if you lose those forms of communication, how are you going to communicate? How are you going to communicate if you're here today and God forbid something were to roll through and we're all stuck here on campus? You can't get out. People can't get into you. How are you going to communicate to your loved one or your spouse, significant other, children, what, what's up with you and what's going on with them? Like, well, what's the plan for that? People don't think about that stuff. They just always assume that they're going to have the everyday luxuries available to them. Um, so, you know, again, how are you going to communicate? Not only just how are you going to communicate out, but how are we as a Mercer community today, how is this university going to communicate down to its employees on what they need to do? You know, how quickly do they push out weather information? If there's a tornado warning issued for Bibb County, how quickly does that information get disseminated to you so that y'all can take the necessary precautions? And how many of y'all in your departments have actually been communicated to what your safety procedures are so if there is a tornado warning, what to do? Prime example of this is we at FEMA consider ourselves the experts, and I use that term loosely, in, in disaster preparedness and response. You know, we are the governmental agency responsible for that. How many people remember the earthquake that shook Washington DC several months ago. So during an earthquake as a child, probably not so much here because we really don't experience them as often, but you know you're taught to stop, drop, and cover. Well that entire building cleared out. People did not know what to do. When the earth started moving and it started shaking, people get up, they start looking out the windows, not heeding our, their own advice. No one covers. People start evacuating the building, just running, not really knowing where they're going. So even us, as the experts, tend not to practice what we preach. And so we're really trying to get you guys to at least do as we say, not as we do all the time. Um, but we're really trying to be better about that. But again, not having the plan and not exercising the plan and really communicating down to the folks is really, really going to be one of the things that we highlight. And again, what supplies do you need to keep in your home or your car? You know, typically when we talk about preparedness kits or disaster kits, we think about having them in your house ready to roll. But a lot of times disasters happen when you're not at home. And if something were to happen today and you couldn't get home and you were stuck on the side of the road or if you were stuck here at work, you know, how many of you have stuff in your office that you could kind of munch on for, for, a, for at least a little bit to keep you at least somewhat happy uh, and fed and nourished until response folks could get into attend to you? Um, how many of you have healthy snacks in your office? I had to throw that in there since Rachel's here. Alright, so what we're really trying to get folks to focus on for the resolution for this year to, again, to resolve, to be ready, is, again, just these four things. Being informed, making a plan, building a kit, and getting involved. Being informed. Um, I don't know why this picture's on top of this one, so let me see if I can... 
cut this one out. But okay, anyway, sorry. <laughs> I guess my government computer is too high falutin for this um, presentation. But under this, and I'll see if I can't remove it, is, is a picture of a neighborhood in Birmingham um, after the tornadoes where you would see complete and utter destruction. Um, and one of the things that's really important during disaster is staying informed. Um, you know, I happen to, to have worked a lot with your news folks here when I was in Macon and your meteorologists and knowing that you know in this area they do a great job of keeping you guys informed I think just because of the the, the risk that you've had in this community they're hyper vigilant um, emergency management in Bibb County is especially hyper vigilant in making sure that they get the word out to you guys but being informed as to what's going on um, staying in tune to what they're telling you is coming is key I mean heed the warnings that you know they're not they're not out there just pontificating they're actually telling you this stuff for your safety uh, not to view uh, bump up ratings you know they're really trying to get people to to take heed and, and listen to what they're saying but also know what hazards are going to affect your or what risks are going to possibly affect your community for example we know in Bibb County you got the potential for flooding it's happened you've got the potential for tornadoes obviously it's happened you've got the potential for hurricane remnants because it's happened you know you pretty much have the gamut here you also sit on a, a small fault line so you've got the potential for earthquakes so really if it can happen it can happen here in Macon all right so again knowing that and then knowing what you need to do and again being informed as to what's happening and taking the the heed of the folks um, being informed is great via the TV but how many of y'all have weather radios it's a very low number how many people have ten dollars it's all it takes. I, would, I cannot stress enough how important weather radios are. For example, just this last disaster, the one a couple of days ago in Alabama. It happened 2, 3, 4 o'clock in the morning. How many of us are sound asleep at 2, 3, 4 o'clock in the morning typically? So we're not watching the weather. Even the man, we've known all day that it's coming. We're still going to go to bed thinking that we're going to wake up and everything's going to be fine and dandy the next day. So when you go to bed at 11 o'clock, he's telling you it's going to get bad, but nah, it's not going to happen to me. Well, the only way you're going to be woken up is either when the tree falls through your house, you're flying through the air, or you've got a weather radio that goes off maybe 15, 20 minutes prior to have you take caution. So I can't stress enough the importance of weather radios. Again, 10, 15 bucks at Radio Shack. For those that have economic hardships, I know that if you were to call the local emergency management office, they could possibly get you one for free. So again, simple, simple investment, but it has huge, huge returns. It can be a pain because again, on those nights when it's really bad outside, that thing's going to go off all night long. But I would rather be woken up every half hour to take some sort of caution than to be woken up as I'm flying through the air you know so again just again staying informed knowing what you need to do making a plan all right how many folks have played sports okay organized sports even as a kid or as an adult or or been a part of a dance team or a band or whatever part of your performance and how well your performance is is the plan that you have going prior to that performance so it's really really important that you develop a plan and I know that sounds hokey and people are like oh, we got so many other things to worry about in the house I'm not gonna talk about this kind of stuff it's again never gonna happen to me for those of you that still have dinner with your family it would be a great opportunity to just bring it up in conversation one night at the dinner table of hey you know what what are we gonna do if something does happen what are we gonna do if something happens here in the middle of the night when we're all in the house or what we're going to do if something happens in the middle of the day when all of us are either at places of business, schools, wherever we may be. How are we going to link back up? What's that plan going to be? Um, I was raised by a fireman. My dad is a retired fireman. So I grew up hearing this all the time. You know, obviously ours was more about fire drills and fire safety and what do you do? Where's your meeting point outside the house? All that good stuff. But again, we knew it. I mean, he would come home from work thinking he was cute at seven o'clock in the morning and hit the fire the smoke detector to set it off in the house to see how quick we'd get up out of bed to actually try to implement some of this stuff um, so you know it's it's important again to talk about these things you know I, it's one thing to talk about again like what's going to happen at your house that's that's easy you know if we know that we can set up in a meeting point we're going to try to go here but 
the hard part is trying to figure out what are you going to do when you're separated throughout the day? Where are you going to meet up? How are you going to communicate? So talk about it. And then plan it. Figure out exactly what you're going to do. Actually, if you need to, if you're like me and have to put pen to paper, put pen to paper. Put it up on the refrigerator. Whatever you've got to do. But again, plan. Actually write something out or talk it out and, and, and so everybody's aware of it. Learn the plan, obviously. And tell the plan. Don't just keep it internal to your family. Just to your nuclear family. But what about folks outside of the area? You know, grandma that may live in Jones County. If something ever happens here in Bibb County and we, we've got to evacuate the house for whatever reason, this is where we're going to go. This is, this, is, this is the family's plan for where we're going to meet up, where we're going to go. Because if grandma can't get in touch with you and hasn't heard from you for an extended period of time, she at least can direct authorities to where your plan says you guys are going to go. Um, it's also great to have people outside of an area. If you've got extended family that lives parts elsewhere, like for example Rachel's parents live in South Carolina, if Rachel were to have a plan, again making sure that the people possibly outside of the area are included in the plan so that if people needed to find out where Rachel is after disaster, instead of them all trying to call Rachel and trying to claw the communication lines coming into the particular disaster area, she can make one phone call to mom and dad in Goose Creek and then everybody else that wants to know where Rachel is can call mom and dad. Um, one of the greatest things now that we've got is social media and everybody is updating their statuses all the time. Um, and so, you know, if you've got access to that, that's another great way of communicating where you are. Um, but incorporate that into the plan and make sure that people know that's your plan. I can't stress that enough. It's one thing again to plan and plan and plan, just like a coach. I could tell you what route to run, I can tell you what drill we're going to run, but until we actually sit down there, talk about it, we learn it, and then again, we practice it, it does us no good. All right? So practice it. I know that sounds hokey, and I know people are like, whatever. But it, I'm telling you, it saves lives. I bet if I could go and talk to all 243 families from Alabama and say, what was your plan? Probably less than 1% would say they had a plan in place. So obviously, it, it, it can have drastic impacts because we do know, um, just this past week, in Maplesville, Alabama, where they actually have storm shelters built for communities, that's just a way of life. These people know they're coming, they get hit all the time, and so again, families have planned. They know that when the siren goes off, they're going to location X and they're going to hunker down there. So as a result of that, there were 60, the this, this space is built for like 60 people. They somehow fit 120 folks into this shelter during the tornado and all of them fared well. Not a single person was hurt, injured, or anything like that. But again, that was their plan. They knew what to do. Had they stayed in their home, the results may have been completely different for them. Build a kit. All right. This one is an example of one of the ones that uh, Red Cross sells and you know some of the stuff you can put together yourself and I, it's, it's easy to do but then there's also some that are already pre-done and you can just add to uh, Red Cross. These are like 25 bucks. It's, it's cheap easy investment and they're already fixed up for you. Um, but you know it has the basic necessities of life. Food, some food, uh, non-perishable food, water, first aid supplies, flashlights with the batteries, making sure the batteries are not in the flashlight so that you don't run down the batteries and then the flashlight's not turned on, you're still running down the batteries. So just a tip for the day. Um, water. Studies show that it takes one gallon of water per person per day to sustain themselves. And that's not just for drinking or hydration, but that's also for sanitary purposes. So, you know, that's a lot of water. If you've got a, a large family, I'll use Melinda, her family of three. So, I mean, that's three gallons of water per person per day, and if they're going to have to be hunkered down, that's nine gallons of water for a 72-hour period. That sounds like a lot. Um, so what we really suggest is don't buy the gallon jugs of it and keep it like that, but keep bottled water, you know, when you go to Sam's, buy a case or two. Keep one in the refrigerator that you're going to normally drink out of, and then just keep one in a kit or close to your kit ready to roll. So all you got to do is throw that in the back of the car or throw it wherever and head out. Or if you've got a shelter in place and can't leave the house, you at least have that water there for, for sanitary purposes as well as hydration. Um, it's also important to have like maybe a mini kit 
just in your car. Um, again, in case, just uh, how many people break down on the side of the road? I mean, I've driven from Atlanta today and there's cars lining the side of the interstate. You know, it happens. It happens at 3 o'clock in the morning and it's bitter arctic cold outside and you've got to wait for a record or you can't get whatever to come help. What are you going to do? I mean, how are you going to kind of sustain yourself? So, you know, while that's not a disaster in the large sense of the word, to me at that time, it would be quite a disaster. So, again, what sort of supplies can you have on hand in your car? Um, any questions about this stuff? Because that was, I meant to caveat that. At any point you have a question, just shout it out or, or raise your hand. Because I really want to try to be as interactive as possible. And then the last thing that we really want people to do is get involved. Um, these three um, logos there are obviously organizations that I have been familiar with. Um, Red Cross, Salvation Army, amazing organizations to get involved with. Um, I will have to do a plug for both those organizations and say 99% of their workforce are all volunteers. Um, and so they're always looking for more folks to come in and help. But in addition to learning how to respond and how to uh, you know, help your neighbor, they also offer classes to teach you how to be better prepared. Um, and you know, obviously first aid and CPR training is, is critically important and I can't stress that enough as well. But get involved. Find out what the organizations are that you can get involved with at the local level to learn as much as you can, again, to prepare yourself and to be an advocate for disaster preparedness. Medical Reserve Corps is an amazing organization for folks that may be in the medical profession, retired medical profession if they have licensures, nurses, doctors, whatever, CNAs, because obviously when disasters happen, our medical capacity gets surged. And so they're always needing more folks to come in and assist with that type of work. So if you've gotten affiliated with a group like Medical Reserve Corps already, who can come in, your licensure is already up to date, it's checked, you're vetted, that you can actually go in and help the responders respond to the disaster, as well as they'll send you all over the country as, as requested or as needed. Um, obviously, you have the time and are willing to do that. And the last one down here is uh, CERT, Community Emergency Response Team. Um, this is a program that Bibb County Emergency Management runs. It would be a great thing to actually look at possibly having a CERT program brought here to Mercer um, for its employees because really what it does is it's an intense, it's a nine training classes um, and really it gets really into the weeds on um, first aid, light search and rescue, Basically what it does is it trains people how to take care of them and their neighbors when resources are depleted or they're not going to get to you for an extended period of time. So ideally what would be great for Mercer and the Mercer community is if you had CERT teams strategically placed throughout campus. So if something were to happen in the English department or it happens in the psychology building or it happens in the school or the medical school, you've got a group of folks that are trained to actually kind of respond and tend to your own until the resources can be brought in. Um, you know, there's only a finite number of fire trucks in this county. There's only a finite number of police officers. There's only a finite number of resources that are going to be able to be utilized when disasters happen. So, you know, one of the things that we really stress for folks is when it happens, don't expect you're going to get that first police car, you're going to get that first fire truck at your house. Um, because it could be hours, it could be days before they can get in. You know, obviously if there's debris, they can't get in and you can't get out, you know, and, until they can get chainsaws and get all that stuff cleared, they're not going to be any good to you. So how are you going to take care of yourself in the meantime? Um, and so we really would like to see CERT promoted, and I mean it's something that I would really advocate maybe looking into here on campus, and I know the, the merch management would love to look at something like that. I know the University of Georgia um, has one on campus as well where they train a lot of their employees and even some of their students for the same purpose. Because again, think about it, you're a small city. For all intents and purposes, this is a small city within a larger county. And so again, you've got to take care of your own. Like I said at the beginning, we really only see ourselves at FEMA as being a part of the team. Um, where, you know, we don't ride in on white horses um, to save the day. Um, you know, we get black eyes from now and from time to time. Um, but we're just a part of the team. We're there to supplement resources that the locals and the state can't assist with. We come in with a little bit bigger checkbook and a little bit deeper depth to, to really assist further with that. Um, but we do it in partnership obviously with the other governments as well as our nonprofit 
sector, the private sector, your Walmarts, your big box stores, um, have a lot to bring to the table during disasters. But more importantly, it's you guys. Because the more educated you are about disasters and how you can prepare yourself, the less impact it's going to have and the less work that's going to be needed by all these folks and the less tax money is going to be needed to come to your aid. So, you know, I can't stress it enough. Prepare, prepare, prepare. It's going to happen. Hopefully not in the next few weeks or months. But, I mean, think about it. It's just January and we're already starting with the tornadoes. Now we're, I mean, we don't move into prime tornado season until March. And then in June, we roll into hurricane season. So, and then after that, we run into the winter storms and the cold season. So, it's never ending. And like I said before, Macon is prime spot for disasters. Y'all have lived through it, and you'll probably have to live through it again. But hopefully, making a resolution to take just a little bit of what I've said, um, it will minimize the impact to you. So with that, I'll entertain any questions that you guys have, not only just about what I've talked about today, but if there's anything I can, any questions you may have about FEMA, our disaster response, whatever. All gloves are off. Anything you want to ask, feel free. Yes, ma'am. Is there, there is, and I will share the link with Rachel. I've got to email her the slides anyway, but I'll share with her the link. And it's really simple for those of y'all that want to take this down. It's if you just go to ready.gov, everything you've ever wanted to know about disaster preparedness is right there. It will have checklists, it will have a list of all the stuff that you could possibly put in your kit. You know, and your kits, your kits can be anything from, you know, just a small Rubbermaid container to multiple Rubbermaid containers, depending on, you know, how prepared you want to be. Um, and so, and again, what the makeup and the composition of your family is. Um, you know, making sure that you've got Fluffy and Muffy's dog food. Um, making sure that you've got just a list of medications if you're on medications um, because that's always that always gets people um, you know for people that are on a num number of medications especially the elderly they don't know half the, the names of the medications they're on and if they have to evacuate quickly so they have to go to a shelter if they at least just had that list of, of medications when they come in we would at least know where to start to try to get those things refilled and replaced for them um, you know, one of the things I will say about Bibb County that where y'all are an advantage is um, with your public health here, public health here, their emergency response folks are amazing. Um, and they're probably one of the um, leading um, public healths in the state, especially for preparing for the elderly population and those that have functional and access needs. Um, because we can't forget it. And we can't segregate or we can't treat those that may have some sort of disability any differently. Um, and so, again, planning, if you know, if you have family members that have those types of needs, making sure that, you know, if, if grandpa gets a new wheelchair this year because insurance or Medicare has given him a new wheelchair, let's don't throw that old one away. Let's keep it in the closet. So if we've got to get and go, we can grab that so we've got an extra one. So that if he does have to go to a shelter, we've got something um, for him to, to utilize. Or if we've got to get him transported or wherever, we've got those sort of resources. Um, so, so, but ready.gov, that was a long answer to the question. But ready.gov, we'll give you all you need. Any other questions? Don't tell me y'all just came here because y'all want a pizza and points. <laughs> I mean, it won't hurt my feelings, I get it, but. Um, any other questions? I, 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 this is the first group I've ever talked to that doesn't have a question about FEMA in general. So. Yes, ma'am. How often do you replace the perishable item with the kit? It depends. It depends on what what it is. Um, you know, like peanut butter has quite a lengthy shelf life, um, and so I would replace them probably just every six months. You know, just throw them into the pantry, use them, and then replace what you bought next time you go to the grocery store. Every six months. Same thing with water. You know, water does go bad um, because the plastic that the water containers are in actually does break down over time and actually can become toxic. So, you know, rotate that through um, as well. Yes, ma'am. I just write the expiration dates on my bottles of water so that I can see it and I can take it. I just use it for water flowers or something to replace it. Yeah, and then something else too you might want to look at is um, for those of you that want to go hardcore is you know go into like a, the army navy store or you know one of those types of places um, and actually looking at shelf stable meals 
Um, you know, they're, Rachel would kill me because they're very high in calorie and sodium, so they're not the most healthy things, and we don't want you to eat them for an extended period of time, but if it's that or nothing, I'd much rather eat that. And they actually, as retarded as it sounds, they're actually quite tasty. I know when I was here in Macon, I had a vendor stop by and give me some, and actually I opened one up in my office and tried it, and it was actually good. It was chicken and dumplings, and it was quite tasty. I actually took some home, but they wouldn't eat them with me. But, um, but I mean, it's 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 okay. And they're they're relatively inexpensive. But I mean, if you just stock up on a few of those and have them ready to go, you're well ahead of the curve. Any other questions? What kind of legal documents did you have on hand? Legal doc. Great question. One insurance papers, um, and that's another thing we'll talk about. Quickly, insurance. How many? Well, you don't have to raise your hand. People have insurance, hopefully. Homeowners. I just want to know how many people in here are renters? How many people have rental insurance? Okay. Your homework for today is to call your local insurance company to find out how much rental insurance is because it is dirt cheap and it saves you tons of money in the long run. When I lived here in Macon and I rented, I think my rental insurance to my car policy was like $4 a month. Really? I mean, that's, that's a Happy Meal. That's a Big Mac. Whatever. $4 to ensure that my contents, when, it all, when something were to happen, I could get what little bit of stuff I do have back. Um, but your insurance is really important. And what I really encourage people to do is, this is a prime time to do it now that we're kind of thinking about it, is to look at your, your insurance policy now to really find out and dig deep into what it covers. Because a lot of when we come out and we respond to folks, for example, Alabama, the area that was hit this week has about a 65% insurance rate, which is good. However, what we really have to delve into is how many of them are underinsured. Because FEMA, the government, we will come in and we will assist for those that are underinsured just like we would for those who are not insured or those that do have some sort of insurance. So digging deep in to find out exactly what your policy covers. Flood insurance. Most people don't have flood insurance. Again, it's relatively cheap. For me, when I was quoted, when I just bought a house in Atlanta, mine was $12 a month to be added to my existing policy. Flood insurance is really important because, I'm telling you, if you get flooded out, your insurance company will turn and walk the other way if you don't have any sort of flood rider on your policy at all. And we are fighting this battle in North Carolina because a lot of the folks there didn't have flood insurance because they technically didn't live in a designated floodplain. However, storm drains clog up. Things happen. You may live on a creek and it rises rapidly. If that water comes into your house from the bottom up, it's considered a flood and your insurance company is not going to touch it because I don't want to offend anybody if they're in the insurance business or married to one but they're in the business to make money and so that they can get out of having to pay a claim it increases their bottom line so again flood insurance can't stress it enough the sad thing for the folks in North Carolina is they those that didn't have flood insurance pretty much are screwed because you know it wasn't a huge wind and hail event so their normal homeowner's policy would have covered damage like that. So where those people did have damages, literally you would have an insurance adjuster come up and say, this was flood, this was wind and hail, so we're only covering damage from here up. So you'd have people who their second floor of their home could be fixed, but they couldn't get into their second floor because their bottom floor couldn't be fixed. So again, looking into that and really looking at what your insurance policy says will save you a ton and ton and ton of headaches later on down the road. But that is one of the legal documents that I would say to just keep a copy of, uh, making sure that you just don't have it in the house, in that drunk drawer that we all have. You know, make sure if you've got a family member that you can, that you're close enough to that you don't mind snooping through your stuff. You know, pass it off, give them a copy. Or now with the modern computer age, scan a copy and save it on a flash drive or save it on your computer at work. Don't tell Mercer I said you'd do that. But, you know, those types of things. Um, insurance is obviously important. Social security cards. 
if you at least keep a copy of your social security card because when you lose that sort of documentation do you know what a nightmare it is to go get something new or done for you without having it because you know women y'all are amazing you know if something happens right now not a single one of y'all would leave a purse in this room right like the first thing you grab anytime you go anywhere is a purse you got it you know where it is but if you for whatever reason can't get to it and you lose your license or you lose any other important papers that you may have in that purse if you had to get those items replaced without that social security card you can't get an ID. Without an ID, you can't get a birth ticket. And you know, it's just a vicious cycle. Uh, this was a nightmare during Katrina for a lot of our folks because, again, they relocated quick or they were pulled out of their homes and didn't have that stuff, and it was a nightmare. Um, so those sort of legal documents are really, really important. Um, if you do have, you know, kind of any sort of like power of attorney types of things, making sure that you have those as well um, so that you can grab them and go. Um, you know, and. I know it sounds like we're saying to spend a lot of money to do this kind of stuff, but you know, even look in investing in a safety deposit box. You know, just to, again, just to keep a copy of all this stuff there, or keep the originals there and you keep a copy of the house, whatever. Um, but just making sure that it's stored somewhere so that it's fairly accessible if you needed to get to it. Um, any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Um, I noticed in your um, kit again, did, did, was there a blanket in there? There is this. Um, let me look. I think the blanket that they show. And maybe um, some rain here. Yes, yeah, actually, this right here is a blanket. It's a little aluminum foil blanket that actually the things are hot if you actually have to sleep up under one. Um, but a blanket, um, any kind of like rain gear, like you say, um, something like that would be great. Um, I mean, pretty much you you can tailor it. You know, I mean, really, I could give you a list this long of stuff that we say it would be a great item. I mean, but you would be pulling a U-Haul trailer behind you if you needed to go somewhere with it all. So again, you know, thinking what's, what's the most severe threat and... and the, excuse me, and the reason why I'm saying that is because I'm, uh, I'm a survivor of Katrina and I did come here after the storm immediately. It was horrendous what we went through. It was just horrendous. I mean, I wasn't in the water or anything like that. But um, being a woman, like you said, I had everything possibly put in a truck and in a car. We evacuated with three car loads of family members heading this way instead of west because everybody was heading west to Texas. We decided to go east, which to us was better. But um, as far as the paperwork, I had my marriage license in there and a couple of death certificates mm -hmm. that we just carried around. And all my kids' immunization. Ah, that's great. Especially if you've got school-aged children that are going to need them. And Anything important, I had a lockbox, and I always cared whenever we had to evacuate for hurricanes, because of course I lived in New Orleans, and that's, that Katrina was my fourth time evacuating, and I carried three days of clothes, but we know what happened about that, because we just knew we were coming back within three days. Yeah, and, and I've got a question for you, is how, how, do, how is the banking situation for you? Awful. Were you able to access your money? Actually, because I banked with Chase and Bank of America. You were able to get um, I was able to access my money yeah. that way. But as far, to add a little footnote, I brought my bills with me. That's me. Because I continued to pay. I never did get back into the city uh, right away, of course. Mm -hmm. But I continued to pay my bills because I was afraid of, of, of bad credit. I know a lot of people didn't. I still had a house note to pay until my insurance kicked in. Mm -hmm. But I continued to do that only because I, I, I just did not want to go down. Well, that's the responsible. Well, that's the responsible thing to do. So, I mean, that's the great, and that's great information. Um, I do know that, like you know, when disasters happen, and again, I'm not picking on small local banks because they're all great and federal, you know, credit unions and things like that. But that is one of the things that we've seen come out of some of these disasters is when the complete infrastructure is lost. You know, I don't know about y'all, but I never carry cash. If I, it's my debit card or nothing. You know, and so if I can't get to somewhere that's got power that actually can do it or the systems aren't working 
again, I'm just kind of at a loss. I'm at a dead standstill. So, you know, again, just kind of thinking about if you do have to evacuate for any reason, just stopping off at the bank before you go and getting out whatever sort of cash you can just so you've got some, a little bit of travel money to go with you is, is extremely important as well. The ATMs were shut down. Yeah, we had a huge problem with that, people not being able to access their bank's accounts when they got here. Any other questions? Okay. Any questions about FEMA? I'm sure you could probably educate most people about FEMA. But I will tell you that we are a new FEMA. Uh, you know, we, I, I'm proud to say, I mean, I went from an amazing organization like the Red Cross to FEMA, and I was like, you know, everybody says I went to the dark side. And, and in some ways, you know, I kind of felt like that at first, but then, you know, we're the government, and unfortunately, there's bureaucracy in the government. Um, and, you know, we're, like I said before, we're, we don't pride ourselves to be the ones to come in on the white horses to save everybody. You know, disasters are local events. They happen at the local level, and they end at the local level. Um, you know, Mother's Day tornadoes, prime example. That was a localized event. It was outside the scope of what Bibb County could handle. The state brings in resources outside of what the state could bring in. They request FEMA assistance. FEMA comes in and provides what assistance we can. But when all that system, when all that's over, when people have kind of gone through that system and there's still unmet needs, it comes back to your local organizations. You know, a long-term recovery committee was formed following the disaster that worked with families for at least two years following that disaster to make sure that those unmet needs got met. But it all comes back full circle. So again, you being a part of that local community is very, very important. Um, and so you taking the preparedness that you can so that the county doesn't have to spend all its resources on you and your family will alleviate some of that for other folks so they can spread the wealth. Um, but we are a new FEMA uh, post Katrina. Um, we've made amazing changes and we're getting better as time goes on. I'm not saying we're perfect. Um, I don't think any government agency can say they're always perfect all the time, but we do a really good job. Um, and we're putting money in the hands of people at breakneck speed like we never did before. Um, it's once we verify that they truly have a need, most people are getting their money within 48 hours um, so that they can start to begin their recovery. And it's, for us, it's just about the people, um, you know? So anything that we can do to, to help people suffering through disasters, that's, that's really our goal. Um, sometimes the p political pressure gets to us, but you know, Keeping you folks and the individuals in mind is really kind of what we're there for. So, with that, if there's no other questions, I will let y'all return back to your job.